We're going to get started here. Uh, if uh, those in the back can kind of find your seats, I, I know it's a little crowded here. Uh, so this is this room is on uh, managing freezing of gait and falls in Parkinson's disease. If you're not here for the freezing of gait lecture, you're in the wrong room. Uh, and outside each of the rooms, there are signs uh, telling you what session is going on in each room. Sure. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, this talk on managing freezing of gait and falls in Parkinson's disease is going to be given by Dr. Uh, Soterios Parashos, who's uh, uh, our keynote speaker. Um, he is a, a clinician with um, an extensive background in um, researching gait and falls in Parkinson's disease. Uh, he's a neurologist with the Minneapolis Clinic of Neurology and the lead research physician at the Struthers Parkinson Center in Minneapolis, which is a National Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence. And he's currently a clinical professor of neurology at the University of Minnesota. He serves as a member on the Community Advisory Board of the Struthers Parkinson Center, on the work group for Parkinson's disease quality of care measures of the American Academy of Neurology, and on the Parkinson's Outcomes Project of the National Parkinson Foundation. His research centers on non-dopamine related symptoms of Parkinson's disease, like falls, cognitive dysfunction, natural history of Parkinson's disease, and the role of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach in the management of Parkinson's disease. He's co-authored many articles, published in peer-reviewed journals, and given numerous lectures on Parkinson's disease. And of note, he's written a book entitled Navigating Life with Parkinson's Disease with physical therapist Rose Wickman, also of the Struthers Center. And so I want to thank you for attending the session, and I want to welcome to the podium Dr. Parashas. Thank you, Kevin, for this very nice introduction, and uh, uh, thank you to the uh, Michigan Parks Foundation for inviting me to, uh, to deliver this lecture today. Uh, also, thank you for all the people with Parkinson's disease and their their care partners and their families, and also all the healthcare uh, professionals who uh, honor me with their presence uh, this afternoon. Um, and thank you for your welcome. Um, first things first, this is my disclosure. Uh, being a physician and not a politician running for office, I have to disclose any kind of relationship I have with industry or even with nonprofits. I'm trying to keep this to a minimum, but it's part of doing business in healthcare nowadays, and to a degree unavoidable if you do research. So today I will talk to you about two phenomena that happen as Parkinson's disease advances. These two phenomena are fairly distinct, but they also have some similarities and they overlap. So this, this uh, talk will go a little bit back and forth, and uh, uh, I will try to avoid as much as I can any redundancies. Um, as I said, they, uh, uh, they, 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 um, these two phenomena uh, have some similarities. They're both heterogeneous phenomena. That means that these phenomena both have very different potential causes and, and multiple different mechanisms that are behind them, which makes it a little bit more difficult to study them and even more difficult to treat and manage them. They both can cause significant disability. They both affect quality of life in Parkinson's disease to a great degree. They may both lead to big complications, like you fall, you break a leg, you may be in a hospital, so they cause increased what we call morbidity and even mortality, even death in some of our patients. And they're both somehow associated with an increased risk of dementia. And the problem is that the response to treatment with medications has been inconsistent. And therefore, they require more of a customized approach to management and more of an individualized analysis of the, of the reasons behind this phenomena in each patient, and then try to attack the root causes. 
So uh, I'll start with freezing of gate first, and there are a few definitions out there in the literature. I do like these two definitions because they touch on the main characteristics of freezing, which is an inability to initiate the first step of gait or even inability to propel oneself by putting one foot in front of the other mid, in the midst of walking. And this happens episodically. It doesn't happen all the time. It happens only certain times under certain circumstances, which are not always consistent or predictable. And sometimes this phenomenon may respond to things like focused attention in order to overcome the problem. How often does this occur? This is a recent uh, study from Norway. This was an epidemiologic study. They looked at 232 people with Parkinson's disease in a specific geographic area in Norway. All the cases were included. They looked at them at the beginning, and then they looked at them 12 years down the road. And what they found is that even at the beginning, about one quarter of them had some kind of freezing of gain. But by the end of the 12 years of disease, the full two-thirds of them were experiencing freezing of gain. So this is a very common problem, especially as the disease progresses. When the same investigators tried to look at risk factors of freezing, though they didn't come up with very much uh, of interest. They, they, they said, well, you know, if you have motor fluctuations, if you need to take more levodopa, if you have more postural instability and gait problems, and if you have things like hallucinations and paranoia, you're more likely to have freezing of gait. But all these things are also markers of oh, your disease is more severe or more advanced. So all we could tell is that the more your disease advances, the more likely it is that you will develop freezing of gait. And there's probably a good reason why it's hard to identify specific risk factors for freezing of gait. I think that the biggest reason behind this is that freezing is not one phenomenon. Freezing can be caused by many different causes and may have many different responses to medications and treatments. So one of the first steps that we have to treat when we try to, to, to one of the first steps that we have to take when we try to treat or even to study freezing of gait is we have to develop a good classification scheme and understand that not all freezing is the same and then realize or investigate what types of freezing exist and then try to attack each type separately. So we know now that, that, that freezing, according to its response to levodopa, can be off-time freezing, freezing that happens only when the patient is off, when the levodopa doesn't work. There is on and off time freezing. So this is freezing that happens regardless of whether you're on or off and does not seem to respond to how much levodopa and when you take your levodopa. And then the third type of freezing, which is the most rare one, is on time freezing. These are people who freeze only when they're on. It's almost like a type of dyskinesia. Moreover, from what we have learned from uh, studying the brains of people who have experienced freezing, Unresponsive freezing, DOPA unresponsive freezing, is more associated with kind of frontal lobe dysfunction, while the responsive, the L-DOPA responsive freezing is more associated with, with dysfunction in the back parts of the brain, the parietal and temporal lobes. So the bottom line is that when we study freezing of gait and when we try to treat and manage freezing of gait, it is very important to address one type of freezing, otherwise we're just mixing apples and oranges and we're not gonna be able to come up with much. I'm not even going to go through this slide. These are all the sources from which we get information about the mechanisms behind freezing. It is very interesting that there is a lot of information. If you try to read this literature, it's trying to drink out of a fire hose. The problem is that there is a lot that's inconsistent, some of the findings are not reproducible, and some of the findings are even contradictory to each other. But certainly, we're starting to see a path towards understanding freezing. One of the main reasons why there is such diverse data is that most of these studies have small patient populations, and they don't discriminate 
according to freezing subtype. So this summarizes the methodological challenges that we have when we try to study and treat freezing. When we try to define a person as a freezer or non-freezer, we give them a historical, basically, questionnaire. They fill a number of questions, we score the sheet, and we decide whether they're freezer or non-freezer. Well, this has a problem that if somebody is about to develop freezing but did not have developed that yet, then you will erroneously classify this person as a non-freezer, when in reality, they're a freezer in the making. Very often, uh, freezers in these studies are not classified as to the type of freezing, which is what I already alluded to. The problem is episodic. Now you see it, now you don't. So it's very hard to study something that may or may not be there when you're looking. And it's there when you're looking the other way. And this has led also to inability to consistently elicit freezing in a gate lab, where we bring the patient into the lab, we try to have them go over an obstacle course, they may do it fine this moment, they may have a lot of freezing the next. So there's no consistent way to reproduce freezing of gate. The other approach to studying freezing is a top-down method. You start with a hypothesis, you make a theoretical model. What do you think is causing freezing? What part of the brain is malfunctioning? And there is four models right now that are um, the most discussed models. And there's good chance that different models are at work with different types of freezing. And there's good chance that multiple models may be at work in one person. So the first model is a threshold model. And that, what that says is that freezing happens because there is a cumulative effect of the motor dysfunction. So, you know, you start by shuffling. When you walk, you, your clearance is reduced, your stride length is reduced. When that comes to a head, your stride length is zero, your clearance is zero, and that's freezing. Although this is an attractive and simple, straightforward thought, lab investigations do not quite um, support this, this, this uh, model. The remaining three models have the common theme that they involve cognitive function. So the first model is called, the, third, the second model is called the interference model. So basically what that says is that your, your brain can only handle this much if you have Parkinson's, and you can only hold so many balls in the air at any given time. So when you're overwhelmed, when the system is overwhelmed by you know, trying to go through a narrow passage, for example, your motor control breaks down and you experience freezing. The, the third model is a simple way of putting it is that your brain is incapable in certain circumstances of deciding which foot to put forward. And the third model, again, in a simplified way of looking at it, says that your brain activates the wrong software for the motor task that you're trying to achieve. Now, you notice here that these three models all involve cognition. And we do think that cognition and freezing are very much connected. So what I'm going to show you here is not directly a study of freezing, but it's a study of gait that we did in our, in our clinic. I took the numbers out to keep things simple. But basically what we did here is we compared how people did in various measures of their walking, of their gait, and how they did in a simple battery of tests that test the frontal lobe function. The way this is laid out here is that uh, you have all the gait tests here and the frontal cognitive tests here. And every cell represents the association between the two. Yellow cells are highly significantly associated. Gray cells are not. And the mustard are not as highly significantly associated. So if you look at this, there are two things that pop out. All the gait measures that you used 
were highly associated with a little test that's called the lexical fluency. That's when you ask a person to tell you as many animals as they can think of in one minute. The other test that was highly associated with all gait measures was a test that's called the go-no-go -no -go test. It's a simple task which actually depends on the ability of the brain to inhibit an almost automatic reaction. So your ability to generate words, which is a function of mental flexibility, and your ability to suppress what comes spontaneously, were most associated with gait problems, or rather the inability. So now uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'll talk a little bit more about management. As part, and part of management of freezing of gait is measuring it or, or trying to assess freezing of gait, gait in general. And because the two are associated, I also included here balance. So a few years back, the Movement Desert Society formed a task force and said, okay, there's a lot of measures out there for gait and balance, and we use them in our patients indiscriminately, but what works, what is recommended, what should we stay off of, and what is suggested, and so on and so forth. So they, the, the task force came up with a number of suggestions, and this is just here as a reference for the healthcare professionals in the audience. I'm not gonna go through this, but I will focus on this. The conclusion was that no instrument comprehensively and separately evaluates all relevant PD-specific gait characteristics with good clinometric properties, and none provide separate balance and gait scores with adequate content validity for PD. Basically, this says that the measurement instruments that we have for gait and balance in Parkinson's are not nearly good enough or not nearly as good as they ought to be. So then we go to the management of freezing, and we'll look at managing freezing with medications first. And for the off-related freezing, the answer is pretty straightforward. You just try to reduce off times. You can do that by using you know, the more extended forms of levodopa, or you can try to use extenders of levodopa, like COMT inhibitors and MAOB inhibitors. Or you can even do that with, with deep brain stimulation. As long as your goal is not to reduce freezing, your goal is to reduce off time or alleviate off time. For on-related freezing, uh, that's kind of like almost up there with dyskinesia. You have to reduce the levodopa, but that may or may not work. So people have looked if instead of adjusting the levodopa, if you add a dopamine agonist, will you be able to eliminate freezing? without reducing on time? And the answer is no, the freezing actually got worse with dopamine agonists. And for the levodopa unresponsive freezing of gait, the, the stuff that happens only when you're on, there hasn't been much done. This is a very rare form of freezing of gait, but there was a recent small study that said that continuous intestinal infusion of, of levodopa may have helped. This was a very small study, and I don't know if there's gonna be any bigger studies coming, but I think that we're gonna be accumulating more experience with this drug in the next years. We'll have a better feeling about it. Now, a few years back, Nir Gelati put together this table in a publication of the various different drugs that have been used besides dopaminergics and Parkinson's medications to see if they would help freezing. And again, this is there as a reference um, but the, um, the results were not very encouraging. I mean, there were some initial encouraging results that eventually um, larger studies did not really confirm. So how about deep brain stimulation? And there are two questions to ask, and I will also review false and deep brain stimulation here because they, are kind, of, they kind of overlap and I don't want to be redundant. So uh, freezing of gait and falling with deep brain stimulation, there's two questions that we have to ask. First of all, can we find a target 
that works specifically for freezing or for falling. And the second question is, the, the, the targets that we're using now, how do they work with freezing and falling? Do they help or do they hurt freezing and falling? And again, there is a lot of data that were collected over the last few years. There has been a particular interest in a, in, a, in a nucleus that's in the brainstem. It's called the peduncula pontine nucleus, or PPN for short. And PPN, along with substantia nigra pars reticulata, are thought to have a particular role in maintaining postural stability. And because of this, it was thought that it might be a good idea. And I'm not going to go through the literature that proves that, because that would be another one-hour lecture. But the bottom line is that it was the obvious it was the obvious target for DBS. So the initial studies were open label and were very encouraging. There were a few cases here and there. But then once uh, double, double blind trials started, we found out that there were no improvements in the objective measures of freezing, but there were uh, improvements in subjective questionnaires of freezing, and there were improvements in the number of falls of people who had this, this kind of procedure. Now, we don't quite know what that means because, you know, reduced falls can happen if you are not as active physically, so we don't know for sure. These are small studies. So there was a meta-analysis of all this data that, that, that said that there were pretty significant improvements in postural instability, but not in freezing. So falling less, but not freezing any less. And the collective evidence was insufficient to generalize to everybody with Parkinson's. Again, we run into the problem, small studies, small patient population, not very good classification of the phenomena that we are addressing. Then there was a recent systematic review that looked at what we're doing, which is subthalamic nucleus and GPI, and also the data on, on SNR and PPN. And for the STN and, and uh, GPI, which is what we do now in the current standard treatment uh, mode um, for wearing off and dyskinesias and so on and so forth, there was evidence that gait parameters, when you measure actual gait parameters, did improve after the surgery, and also postural co control when a person is standing. However, there was no effect, or in some studies, the surgery worsened dynamic postural control. In other words, maintaining your balance while you're in motion. And this was in particular, particularly evident with the subthalamic nucleus stimulation. And as for the SNR and PPN, again, what the previous meta-analysis found, there were some improvements in postural stability and falling, but, um, but no effect on gait parameters. Another strategy to manage freezing has emerged lately. Well, I shouldn't say lately. We've been aware of it for many years, but it started being more studied more formally lately, and that is cueing. Sensory cues may help people overcome the freezing phenomena. And these sensory cues may be visual, visual cues, um, like stripe patterns on the floor or laser light, like this. Um, I have two big thumbs for this thing. Um, uh, or specialty canes or specialty gate assistive devices. Auditory uh, cueing has helped. There's even a smartphone app that has been designed to help um, uh, pace a gate in people with Parkinson's disease. There's also self-initiated cueing, like counting or humming or rocking from side to side or tapping one's thigh. Uh, and, and imagery has also shown some, some um, uh, promise where, where people can actually rehearse the, the, the motor action in their head before they actually perform it. So I'll show you some examples of this. Okay. So this is a lady who is using a wheeled walker. Let's see if I can make this thing go.
problem here. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. It's working over here, but not over there. It's going, but over there is frozen. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That worked, but now it stopped. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, good. So you'll notice that she freezes here as she tries to cross the threshold. And again with turn. So now here, what we did. Now she has this bright ribbon that's tied across the rear legs of your walker. And let's see if this will work. I think I killed it. All right, let's try this again. Not necessarily. I think that it's within her field as she walks. But. No, not necessarily. It's a bright object in her field, though. And now here. She's using a modified walker. That's the U-step stabilizer with casters. And it's a little difficult to see, but that projects a little red laser line in front of your feet. So let's see if this works. Again, quite well. Not everything works for everybody, but you've got to try a few things. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, this gentleman will demonstrate both the freezing and one of the strategies that he uses, which is to stop and then rock side to side and go to cross the threshold and to go through the doorway. Stop. Rock side to side. Start over with the big step. That was one of our physical therapists who has a very loud voice. <laughs> and this, don't try this at home. Uh, he will demonstrate what might be the bad results of freezing as he's trying to go and sit in his easy chair.
He actually turned around and said, did you get this? <laughs> and here is how he uses an avoidance strategy. So stop. stop. Step long. Turn around. And sit. All right. Now, you saw how you know training a person or trying different cues might help them over, uh, overcome freezing, but that's the clinic. What we do need to know and where do we need we do need to work is that we need to see how this person is functioning in his day-to-day -day activities and how to help overcome that. And it takes a team approach to this that will involve the neurologist and the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, and most likely will also involve a home evaluation. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to show you a video that was produced by the um, neurology department there at Booth University in Nijmegen uh, in the Netherlands. And I picked this and I'm showing it with their permission because it illustrates very nicely how a team approach can help with freezing and how it can help improve a person's life. Freezing is een onhandigheid die je dagelijks leven steeds maar achteruit stelt. Je kunt niet meedoen, want zodra je probeert, probeert mee te doen en je dus moet onderwerpen aan de tucht van, van wat er om je heen gebeurt, dan, uh, dan, dan, dan lukt het niet. Hoe gaat het met u? Ja, nou best wel goed. Maar het, het belangrijkste klacht is toch nog steeds het vriezen. En uh, daarmee bedoelt u? Dat je soms niet op gang kunt komen. Mm -hmm. Soms midden in de stappen stokt, als het ware, wil het, wil het been wil het niet meer bijgetrokken worden. Dan heb je de neiging om te remmen, ongewild, ja. en de neiging dus om voorover te vallen. Dat is meestal in kleine ruimtes. Als ik, als ik, als ik alles, alles om me heen onder controle heb, dan kan ik me redelijk handhaven. Maar in thuis, als je om stoelen heen moet lopen en kleine bochtjes moet maken. Ja, het is een bekend verschijnsel. U noemt het zelf ook al bevriezen. Het is, ja. het is ook eigenlijk letterlijk bevriezen. En het is een verschijnsel wat veel bij de ziekte van Parkinson voorkomt. Wat niet iedereen heeft, maar wat wel een bekend verschijnsel is bij de ziekte. En het is inderdaad alsof je aan de grond genageld staat. Dus u omschrijft het heel goed. Ja. Het lastige is dat we met medicijnen daar soms wel wat verbetering in kunnen bewerkstelligen. Maar nog niet eens zo heel veel. En dat is wat u zelf dus merkt. Hè? Ja. Het wordt wel ietsje beter. Maar er zijn nog steeds momenten waarop het heel lastig is. Ja. Um, maar het is wel zo dat er nog strategieën zijn waarmee u zelf kunt proberen om daar wat aan te doen. Ja. En daar kan de fysiotherapeut en de ergotherapeut u wel heel goed in helpen. Ja. Om dat soort strategieën en trucjes aan te leren. A physical therapist can help the person with Parkinson's disease to overcome freezing by providing specific stimuli, so-called cues. There are several ways of cueing. An example of a visual cue is a striped pattern on the floor, which may enhance the size of steps. Another type of cueing is an auditory cue, like a beat. By asking the person to step on the rhythm of the beat, steps become larger and walking speed may improve. Finally, attention can be increased by asking the person to focus on taking high steps, for example, or to maintain stepping when turning. This can help to avoid an episode of freezing. Tactile cues can also be considered, such as tapping with the hand on the thigh to initiate a first step. Freezing occurs especially when turning and walking in confined spaces, and this is common in daily activities. The problem is more pronounced when the medication is wearing off, or in stressful contexts, like in a crowded shop. The occupational therapist discusses with the person ways to reduce time pressure and stress in activities. When freezing episodes occur more at certain times of the day, we discuss how patients 
can plan his activities to accommodate fluctuations in daily functioning. We liaise with the physical therapist about the best strategies for the individual patient to facilitate better and safer movement. After that, we practice application of these strategies in the specific activities and contexts. In this case, at home in the kitchen. The occupational therapist evaluates as well whether adapting the setup of the space and materials for the activity will enable better movement during the activity. Nou, dat uh, die ergotherapeutische aanpak bevalt me wel. Je krijgt een beetje ritme in het, uh, in het, in het uh, dagelijks gebeuren. En je komt een beetje los van die uh, dwangvervliezing. Als je je wat blootstelt aan de dwang van, de, van, van, van wat je geleerd hebt van de, van de ergotherapeut, dan kom je los van de, van de dwang die het dagelijks leven op jou toevoegt. En dan kun je meer, lijkt het een klein beetje meer zelfstandigheid kun je daarmee, daarmee uh, verwerven. En dat is, een, uh, dat is handig voor het doen en laten, maar het is ook handig voor je geest, die toch weer een klein beetje meer die zelfstandigheid benadrukt. I think this was a very good summary of the impact that this approach can have on a person's life. Now, we neurologists um, are not accustomed to referring a patient to the occupational therapist when the problem is freezing. And yet you saw that this person was most helped by the intervention of the occupational therapist. Yes, the cues helped, but going through him, you saw all those complicated diagrams that the occupational therapist was drawing. They really, she really did a lot of work trying to figure out exactly what are his needs day to day and address them one by one. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about falls. Um, falls is a problem in Parkinson's disease. We looked at it about a little over 10 years ago. We sent a survey to all of our patients. At that time, we had a little over 1,200 patients. We sent a survey. We got about, 100, uh, about 1,100 responses, which right there tells you that this is a big, big concern for our patient population. What they told us is that more than half of these people had experienced repeated falls. A little over a third had sustained an injury because of a fall. And close to a third needed some healthcare services because of the injury that they sustained before, because of their fall. In fact, maybe one in 20 of all these people ended up having to have surgery because of fall. So falls is a big problem. But at the same time, the Sydney study results came out of 15 to 18 years uh, uh, results of the Sydney study. Um, and they had determined at that point that 81% of people with Parkinson's disease experienced falls by 15 to 18 years of the disease, and 23% of them had, had sustained fractures because of these falls. You see that's up there with cognitive decline, hallucinations. These were the biggest concerns of people with Parkinson's disease at, at that stage. It's not a tremor, it's not a dyskinesia. It's falling cognitive dysfunction. Also, caregiver burden was increased because of falls, as much as mental health problems, depression, hallucinations, or confusion. So a big part of what determines quality of life in the later stages of the disease. So we looked at that. Uh, the National Parks Foundation has implemented this Parkinson's Outcomes Project, and that started in 2009, where uh, people with Parkinson's disease enroll and they're followed um, once a year with specific uh, examinations and so on, so they collect data as the disease progresses. And right now, it's up to 8,000 and release around the country. But uh, back then, when we got the first about 1,500, 1,400 people, um, we decided to look at what's the relationship between falls and quality of life and caregiver burden. And you have two panels here. The left panel is quality of life. The right panel is caregiver burden. And the, in the left panel, we split people between fallers, which are the red dots, and non-fallers, which are the green dots. 
and we looked at their quality of life in each one of the eight different domains of a quality of, uh, quality of life uh, um, uh, questionnaire that's specified specifically for Parkinson's disease. The higher the number, the worse the quality of life. You see that the fallers scored worse than the non-fallers in every aspect that determines quality of life in Parkinson's disease. This panel here tells you this is a caregiver burden questionnaire. So this is a questionnaire that determines how much burden the caregiver feels as they take care of their loved one with Parkinson's. And that increased as the frequency of falls increased. So then naturally, you want to see, gee, you know, can we tell who is at risk of falls, and can we prevent it? Can we intervene early enough to prevent this from happening, alter the course, and so on and so forth? So first thing that you need to know is, what makes you fall? What's the risk factor for falling? And a lot of the studies that were done so far identified that the most important, single most important factor, risk factor for falling is if you have fallen before. But one might say that by then the cat's out of the bag, so you know, maybe you missed the opportunity. Question is, what determines that somebody who is not falling will start falling? And how can we identify this person and interfere, inter intervene before they start falling? And so we used, again, the same database in the National Parks Foundation um, um, uh, Parks Outcomes Project. And we did that when there were about 4,000 then release. And we found that uh, during the first visit, 4,000 and released that had two visits, first visit, second visit. So we found out that in the first visit, about uh, 3,200, 3,300 people did not have any falls yet. So we said, okay, well, you know, they're gonna come back a year later, we'll see how many of those started falling. And we'll see, we'll collect some data and see what determines who's gonna become a faller in the next year. So we looked at factors, we, we stratified these factors, risk, risk factors. We started with factors that were present baseline visit, like you know, how long have you had Parkinson's? We don't have any impact on that. Or how old are you? Are you a man or a woman? What medicines are you taking? Then the second level of analysis was what kind of objective measurements do we have? Um, we checked your horn and yard stage, we did the timed up and go test, we did some memory testing which ones of those are the most informative? What kind of changes did we implement during this first visit? And what happened in your health in general between visit one and visit two? And we kind of like stacked these factors. Now, this slide is not to be read. It just <laughs> shows you all the factors that we examined. So we, we did a very much in-depth analysis. We did a hard work trying to identify, trying to collect a lot of data and identify a lot of factors. And this is what we came up with. And the highlighted areas are the different blocks. Remember that the, the first block, what's there already at visit one. Second block, what did we measure? Third block, what did we do for treatment? And fourth block, what happened to your health between visit one and visit two? And this is, what predicts that if you're not a faller now, you will become a faller in one year? There were no, not many surprises in this. Uh, we found out, for example, that if you have motor fluctuations, if you take more L-DOPA, which means your disease is, of course, more advanced or more severe, if you use antidepressants at baseline, you're more likely to become a faller. Also, if you have had deep brain stimulation, you're more likely to become a faller, which may jive with what we talked about earlier when we were talking about deep brain stimulation with freezing and falling. Um, of the measures, if you were stage two or stage three, then you're more likely to become a faller. If you're stage four and five, you don't walk so much, so you're not going to be falling. Um, but also, of all the tests that we did, the semantic fluency was predictive of who's going to fall. And that's how many animals you can come up with in a minute. So the fewer the animals, the more likely it was to become a faller. Short-term memory was not an issue. Retention was not an issue. But the semantic fluency was important. As to the treatments that we did, people who had these treatments were more likely to become a faller. But this may simply mean that these people needed more help. They already needed more help. 
So you already start seeing that this person is on a trajectory to start developing falls. They need help with their activities of daily living. That's why you send them to occupational therapist. There may be mental health or social issues. And finally, in terms of comorbidities, if they got diagnosed with cancer between visit one and two, or if they had a worsening arthritis, that would make them fall more, something that we don't often look at. So as I said, you know, there, there's no big surprises there. So why? Why can't we just find a good predictor of who's going to fall? So a few years back, we did another study where we had 340 people with Parkinson's, and we had them keep a diary for four weeks of their falls. They had to record their falls. They had to write down a little story about how they fell. They had a checklist of all the symptoms. They had to check if they were present when they fell or not. And these are three illustrative cases. The first lady fell six or seven times. Every single time she fell as she was putting away her dishes from her dishwasher into the cupboard above her sink. The second man was up on the ladder, one foot on the windowsill, trying to clean the upper right corner of a window. And the third man was, was trimming his, bu his bushes in his yard, tripped on some cut branches, went, took a nap for 30 minutes, came back, tripped again, and fell again. So there are, there are a few things here. First of all, these are very different falls, right? The, the, the potential causes of these falls are very different. The second thing that's interesting is that there's a little bit of a failure of judgment there, right? I mean, if I, were, I fell seven times in a month because of the way I was putting my dishes away, I would change the way I put my dishes away. <laughs> and actually, we asked this lady, because there is a little bit of a cognitive behavioral therapy that goes in there. We asked this lady, is there anything you could have done different to prevent that? And she couldn't think of anything. Then we asked her, why do you think, why do you, think you fell? And she said, because of stupidity. <laughs> so that's what she said. And then uh, the second man here, you know, I mean, you, you have Parkinson's. I wouldn't dare climbing up on the, on the ledge to clean the windows, you know? But if you have Parkinson's, you should know better, right? Uh, and the third one, you know, the obvious thing is that if there's clutter in your workspace and you fall, you clear your clutter before you go on with your work. So clearly here there was some problem solving issues. So, as I said, different types of falls. So not all falls are equal, not all falls are the same. Can we tell them apart? Can we classify them? Because if you classify them, then you might be able to identify risk factors. You might be able to identify customized approaches to management. But until you have the different classes, then you're mixing apples and oranges, and you're going to keep coming up with, oh, people who fall are the people who have more advanced disease, and that's about it. So we applied to our data, there were 1,200 falls in this database, and we applied a statistical analysis called latent class analysis that is designed to identify different classes of this phenomenon. We identified five different classes of falls. Two were happening during walking, and the one class was forward, the other was sideways. One happened at rising and sitting. One class were falls that were happening as people retropulsed or stepped backwards and fell back. And the fifth class was falls that were happening when people were trying to multitask, like you know, putting on your socks while you're reaching for your shirt. So this summarizes then the methodological challenges that we have in falls. It's a heterogeneous phenomenon with possibly many different mechanisms. We need a consistent definition. What do we call a fall? If you, if you fall back to your chair, is that a fall or is not? To me, it is. Some people say, well, no, you have to be on the floor, all fours on the floor to call it a fall. Well, that's, you, you miss, you'll miss 90% of the falls that way. There is near falls, which, there is near falls, which are not very well defined. And in my opinion, they should be classified with falls. Then we don't have any measure of exposure. I, meant, I mentioned earlier that if you're honing your stage five or four, you don't fall as much. Why? Because you don't walk as much. It's like if you don't go out during flu season, you're not going to catch the flu. Right? So how much are you exposed? So, so we don't have good measures of exposure. These people who fall, are they out climbing the mountains, or are they walking from their kitchen to their dining room and they fall? We don't have any measure of that. 
hopefully wearable technology will help us record some of that and we'll have a reference point to which to refer to as to is one fall a week a lot or is one fall a week very little? Because if you are climbing the mountains and you fall once a week, I'd call that normal. Um, and we need a classification scheme. The scheme that I showed works for some things, but it's probably not the best scheme. We need a bigger study that will collect a lot more data to be able to, to develop better classification um, skill, um, schemes. And very importantly, what we found in that study is more than 50% of the falls happened in non-ambulatory situations. Nowadays, when we try to study falls, we study gait parameters. We study how, how good is your gait. Well, you know, only 40% of these falls happen during walking. The rest of them happen during doing other things. All right, treatment, very quickly. Uh, and here I'm just gonna show you some examples of some of the studies that have been done because it's impossible to cover everything. But there was a lot of excitement a few years back because uh, there was this small study that tried Donepezil, also known as Aricept, which is an Alzheimer's uh, medication that helped reduce falls by about 50%. And there is now a larger study in England that looks at the sister drug of, of, um, of Donepezil, uh, which is Rivastigmine or Exelon, to see if it will reduce falls. Exercise, many studies with exercise on falls, mixed results. And again, I think that a lot of that has to do with does the exercise that you address, that, that you do address the particular type of fall that this person is suffering or not. None of, none of that is included in these studies. But nevertheless, the recent study here showed that highly challenging balance exercise program reduced by one third the number of falls. Again, we don't know the exposure. If people became more careful and they don't do as many things as they used to do before, then of course they're gonna fall less, but that's not the point. We want them to continue to do the same things and fall less. So this is my approach to managing falls. And this is advice for the healthcare professional. First of all, in our clinic we made falls a showstopper. When somebody comes in and says, I started falling, that's it, this is the main thing that we have to address during this visit, and we have to work on that. And the first thing that I do is I get a good history. I wanna know how they fall, what kind of falls they have, because that will determine who among my team will be the first person to, to start with, to help them. So I, I, I try to identify whether are the falls related to fluctuations? Is freezing a factor? Then we should treat the freezing. Is low blood pressure a factor? Then we should treat the blood pressure. Are the medications as good as they can be? Finally, are the cognitive issues? Is there orthostatic hypotension? Are there other problems? You know, do they have a bad hip? Two bad knees? Are those things that need to be addressed? What does the patient do day to day? Do they just sit around watching TV or do they climb mountains? And then we design an intervention. And the intervention is typically multidisciplinary. It involves physical, occupational, speech therapy, cognitive assessment, social assessment, home evaluations. We always, always, always work with training the care partner. The care partner has to be able to help the person stand up once they fall without hurting themselves. So they need their own training we need to look at impact of falling and minimize any impact. Is that, is that person osteoporotic? Do we need to address that? Or is that, are they gonna have a fracture, bed fracture, and be immobilized because of that? And then, of course, we need to include, after all this assessment is done, we need to do ongoing maintenance, which we call practice, and in medicine we call practice exercise. For the people with Parkinson's disease and their loved ones, we say, try to understand, it's a little bit of a cognitive behavioral therapy, try to understand the circumstances of your falling. Why are you falling? Can we false proof their living space, remove clatter, add grab bars where they're necessary, handrail safety measures, consider one level living, and then 
try adaptations like we saw that can reduce freezing if that is a factor. You have to think before you act. Sometimes even rehearsing the whole task in front of you might be helpful to avoid falls. Quit multitasking. No more of putting your pants on standing. That's not an option anymore. Um, things are going to take, take longer. And that's, that's a big boo-boo for people with Parkinson's. It's just, you know, their life has slowed down considerably. Now you tell them, slow down more. But that's very important. Cutting corners will not cut it anymore. It will lead to more falls. Never hurry. Never cut corners. Do a lot of activities that you can in the sitting position. If you can wash your dishes sitting on a stool, do it sitting on a stool. Don't do it standing. And then finally, consider a gait assistive device and look for an occupational therapy and physical therapist in your area who can help you. And that's all I had. <laughs> Made pretty good time. We have time for questions, you think? I'll be able to take questions. Yes. Come again. After you lie down for a while, you feel like you cannot move. Well, you know, there, there is, uh, this, this is a phenomenon that we call a kinesia, but there may be many reasons why this happens, from increased muscle rigidity to um, uh, you know, a lot of our people have nocturnal echinesis where in the night they cannot move in bed. Um, the best approach to something like that would be modifications to your bed. Uh, not, you know, standard modifications to improve bed mobility don't always work for Parkinson's patients. If you see an occupational therapist or a physical therapist who are familiar with this, I usually send them to my occupational therapist. My occupational therapist has a bed in his office, puts people in bed, and then tries different equipment. What I have found helpful is simple things like, you know, some people will put a, a plastic garbage bag between your, 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 your fitted sheet and your mattress, and that helps a little bit sliding, or slippery bed clothes. And there is this device that's called a bed cane. It's kind of like a panel, a, a plywood panel that has like an oversized um, um, uh, cane, like question mark shaped handle. You stick this under the mattress, that helps people roll over and pull themselves up much easier than let's say a trapeze or a standard hospital bed rail. Right, so, so that's, that's, you know, heavy blankets, you know, try to have lighter bed clothes slippery bed clothes and slippery as i said you know the plastic bag under the fitted sheet sometimes helps helps with that as well and and of course slippery i tell people get silks and satins for your night 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 gear yes sir <laughs> 